Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, uh, the only channel that's going to be perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Well, we have done it. We have completed 1980, about 550 games that we went through and played, and the year is done. Happy New Year, and now we are beginning 1981. And if you're thinking, wait a second, that's not a video game. You are correct. We're now going to sparse in just a few magazines in between the video games to get an idea of the culture, pop culture, what was happening at the time, and some publications because the magazines now are coming from, the. you can see the example here is going to be coming from Atari, and we're going to get a little bit more info about what we're seeing besides just the manuals and the games themselves. But uh, just going to dabble a little bit as if this channel didn't have enough already. We're going to include Let's Reads with Let's Plays on a live show. And we're just stacking more and more things on top of one another. But uh, we're going to kick off 1981 with this is the uh, first issue of Analog Computing, which stands for Atari Newsletter and Lots of Games. And the reason I wanted to start with this one is it is the first release and uh, it has a what's new for 1981 inside this release. So let's check this out as we kick off 1981. So for analog computing, uh, this is the premier issue that came out. Uh, this is the January, February issue. And it, this is mostly used for the Atari computer, the 400 and the 800. At this time, Atari is on top in the home computer world and the arcade and at home for the consoles for now in 1981. And that's another reason I wanted to hit on this. So here's the front of the, uh, the front cover for analog computing, the initial issue. And the first magazine we've going to uh, showcase on the channel, it does have some ads in the middle here, but uh, if we go to the table of contents, you can see they have a few articles and we're going to go through these briefly. And so I won't hit on the table of contents too long, but let's move forward to the next one. This is the editorial and uh, they have a brief history of Atari here. In 1972, Nolan Bushnell founded the Atari company in his garage while trying to discover what a television could be used for when not being viewed for network programming. Mr. Bushnell created Pong, the first video arcade game, Atari has since become the largest video entertainment company in the home and arcade markets. The Atari company in 1976 was sold to Warner Communications for $28 million, now a complex exceeding 14 buildings. Atari's headquarters and production facilities are located in Sunnyvale, California. The name Atari comes from a term used in ancient Chinese game. Atari was used as a warning when a player was about to capture one or more of his opponent pieces. Atari was allied to another term in the game, Katsuro. So just imagine you might have been the owner of a Katsuro game system or a Katsuro 400 computer. So for more Atari news, uh, they're going to talk about the first software in 1981. And they have two new games that are coming out. One is Nuclear Reactor Simulator. Uh, the big news is Asteroids and Missile Command. So it looks like these are going to be coming out for the Atari 800 and 400 computer. Asteroids and Mr. Clement will be uh, checking those out. And then uh, Scram, which is a function of a nuclear power plant. Uh, so these programs, looks like they say the first half of 81. So we'll be seeing those at some point in 1981. And then over here on the right side, I love how it has uh, a personal fitness cassette. And there's an example of a screenshot. I don't know if we're going to play that in 1981, but I would be amazed. It'd, it'd be hilarious to see a, a fitness game for your Atari home computer. And you can see they're showing like uh, examples of, I think that's the Dallas Quest. Did that come out in 81? I can't remember. And then if we scroll down here, they have some new products that are releasing the um, home entertainment field. There's the, there's, there's, there's the system there, the VCS. And uh, they have Atari Space Invaders, which is a review of Atari Space Invaders, which is incredible if you think about it. Because we played both the home console version on the 2600 and we played the computer version last year which were exceptional they were very good games i'd give the home console version the the, the nudge and then uh they have um looks like led play fields and some experimental stuff happening in this section which is kind of cool but uh here's some more new products they have a mosaic ram board which is pretty technical but uh, uh, it's a 32K RAM board, which is uh, something big for the time. And if you look down a little bit lower, we got uh, data cassettes used for the Atari Music Computer cartridge. And then they have an advanced adventure program that's going to be available in March, they say, 
where uh, you can use 40K RAM, 80, uh, 810 disk drive. And the 810 disk drive was for the 400 to 800 computer. And it was uh, like the top of the line disk drive at the time. And, and of course, disk drives right now, if you had it for the computer, were very expensive. Most people were doing the cassettes because they were cheaper. And the other reason I wanted to hit up on the magazines is here. If you look here over on the, the right side, it has a triangle graphics demo that you could put into your Atari computer. And we're going to see some uh, demos and games that you could play from the computer. This article here is just a Pascal article. If you want to learn Pascal or Curious, that's what people uh, would be into at the time. And then we have some software for the Atari. There's Spellbound, Math Facts, and looks like there's just uh, two different educational titles that are there. If we scroll down a little further, this is a game called Tank Trap and an advertisement over here for Adventure, which I think I, we already played this one last year. Uh, yeah, or, or there's a, a version that's going to come out on the home, uh, the, the computer version this year. But there's an example of Tank Trap over on the far left side there. And as we keep scrolling down on the first issue of Analog Computing, this is a music composer that you could have used at the time which is amazing if you think of uh, for a home computer in 1981 composing music would be awesome so it's showing you how to use all the different sounds in in uh for your system and then uh over here we got some different software for uh atari this is capture mystery box and simon says <laughs> all three games only 1595 for cassette or 2095 for disc for all three games. And here we go. This is an example of what you'd see in these magazines at the time. This is a game called Blocked. And on the right side, you would type this code into your computer to get the game to, to load. So you're basically programming the game on your system. And you'd find these in magazines at the time. So that, that's an example of Blocked. Here's a hardware review of uh, another one of the systems that's pretty rare. This is crazy. This is a graphic tablet for the Atari 800. $600 to use a graphic tablet back in 1981 for that. that that'd be the, the, we're looking at the top of the line for 1981 for this one. Here's another software review. This is called Mountain Shoot, which is an artillery style game. They got a, a screenshot here, and it's essentially you aim, make a shot, uh, try to hit your opponent on the other side. And we've seen a few examples of those, but funny, we haven't seen the original name atar artillery, which I thought is where they got the term from. And then as we scroll down, we're going to go past a few ads here. We have a uh, software code book, nothing too influential there. Here's a different font edit program, uh, world class, another advertisement. Here we go. This is the different Star Treks. There's five different ones uh, that are coming out with different graphics modes. But I did want to hit on this, which is a little bit lower down here. Uh, there's an example of Star Commander, another title that we'll see eventually. But uh, this is what I wanted to show everyone. Uh, on the right side, there is an example of Warlords, which we haven't seen yet. This is January in the magazine, but uh, I couldn't find a definitive release date for Warlords. But we're going to see that on the arcade and on the home console space. And then right under it is Video Pinball, which we played at the end of 1980. It was one of the last... Uh, things we played because we were playing them in alphabetical order when we couldn't find the exact release date. So there's Video Pinball. We're also going to be able to see Asteroids eventually on the left side and Othello, which is a board game. And then here's an ex another example of a game you could program, Maze Rider. Uh, so cool. Yeah, you can see all this. And if you made one mistake, you have to go back and do the whole thing all over again. Think about that. 1981. Okay, so it's going into, this section here is pretty cool. This is graphically speaking. And then down here, they give examples of the different modes for the Atari um, computer. So at, for people at the time that had the computers, they wanted to encourage them to develop and make things for them. That's why there was code in the magazines. And so here is giving you the different graphics modes. This is graphic mode three and mode zero. And it shows you how many pixels and colors can be had on, on the screen. And if you move down to the next one, this is mode six and mode seven. This is this was available for available for both the Atari 400 and Atari 800. So kind of a cool example of the number of pixels you can have with those different game modes. Then we have a few ads. Uh, this is Atari Stocks. Who cares? We don't want to care about Atari Stocks. And then uh, oh yeah, how to program the uh, Atari joystick and the different stick functions and how you would uh, f find the different coordinates for games you were playing. And then. A few more ads and then nothing else there. I'm looking for, oh, there's another game you could t type in called Sub if you wanted to play a, a typed in game. And I think that, yeah, that's about it for Analog, the very first magazine that we've seen on the channel and the very first magazine by Atari. 
So after analog, we're not going to be rating uh, the magazines, but let's, let's move on to our next one. This is a another magazine that was uh, very popular in the uh, 60s and 70s and then continued going on and on. And in fact, this was the only magazine collection that I could find. If I was going to do magazines in the 70s, this would have been the only one. And this is not just a magazine. This is a journal. And we're not going to go too deep or far into this one because uh, it's so large. Uh, Byte is roughly hundreds of pages each each issue, but I just wanted to hit on the the, the, the cover and explain a little bit about Byte. It's uh, been around whenever people were making computers with kits, and Byte was very helpful finding all the parts they needed and giving information about computers when it was still a hobby. And then, of course, computers snowballed and everybody wanted to have one and they started to build their own and buy uh, self-built computers and then byte continued so this is uh, the january 1981 issue of byte and you can see here they're talking about handheld computers and at the time there's they're starting this hybrid of calculator computer that's 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 coming where the uh, companies that were building calculators like texas instruments are now starting to branch into the computer space. And you can see here, these are handheld computers, but it's almost like a, a, a very powerful calculator. Uh, just examples there. And we're not gonna go through the entire journal. I just wanted to hit on a few things that they had in the table of contents. And you can see how many pages this journal has with it. But um, this magazine has an introduction to, to Atari graphics, kind of like what we saw in analog. And then they have uh, handheld computers and the generation of b the beginning of handheld computers. And then if you look at uh, part 72, there's going to be a section on the NEC PC-8001. This is a new Japanese personal computer, one of the first. And we're going to see the PC, uh, the NEC PC computer and a few of their games later in the year. I don't know the exact release dates, but uh, it's just like, like a preview of what we will be seeing. And we also have uh, uh, an article by Apple. And then over here on reviews, if you look at the top, there's the Sinclair research zx80 which we had seen at the end of last year when it was released and this year we're going to see more uh, zx80 and then zx81 which was the bigger system played a little bit better we actually have games we can play because sadly the zx80 is very difficult i couldn't figure out a way to play any of the games we'll just showcase them uh, on the channel but that was just a quick highlight of byte magazine and we're going to see a, a more of those kind of giving us the context of the landscape of the video game industry so after those two magazines for January of 1981, our very first game we're going to check out is Skiing for the TRS-80 Color Computer. Let's see what the Color Computer has for us. Here's the artwork. There's the front of the box for Skiing. And most likely it's a reconstructed image, but uh, here's the cartridge for Skiing. And an example of the screenshot. Let's take a look at the manual for Skiing. Pretty generic at the time, considering artwork gets the job done, I guess. Oh my gosh, much better picture. Why wasn't this the front of the box? This is the inside of the manual. So this is Skiing um, by Robert G. Kilgus, 1981. And uh, here's our intro. Welcome to Skiing, a fast-moving, exciting game that can be enjoyed by the ski aficionado as well as the aspiring novice. Whether you're ready for the Winter Olympics or just getting off the ground, you'll enjoy the challenge of this three-dimensional sport that can be played in your own home. Three-dimensional. We've already seen games in the 70s start to use the 3D term, and it's almost like video games knew what they wanted to do. They just didn't have the technology to make it happen. And we have a few of those uh, developers that were pushing the limits of the systems to make them look 3D. So I want to see what they mean by 3D skiing. So the object of the game is to maneuver down the slope to the finish banner in the least amount of time between the flags. And there we go. Here we go. For setup, make sure the right joystick's properly connected to the computer. And we know this because we've already had control issues on the Coco. Sometimes it uses second uh, controller port for the first player and so forth. So I have two controllers ready just in case. But to start the game, you just pull the joystick all the way back, push number one, and press the joystick forward, and the starter will say, what, the computer's going to talk to us? Get ready, get set, and a gun signal? Okay, so you can also press two to change the layout of the course. Uh, each course will be random. That's nice. So uh, we've already seen skiing on the Atari and the Intellivision when we were discussing the console wars. So this would be another skiing, uh, first one we've seen for a home computer. I don't think we've seen any skiing on the Atari home computer. 
So it has different uh, controls, joystick controls for different speeds. And oh, okay, it looks like you can use the only button on the joystick to shove your way down the slope. So you can go even faster. That's awesome. And then looks like you can <laughs> hit enter and the crowd will roar for applause. Nice. And then Q for quit. Let's see for different game modes. We got uh, Bonsai Bunny Slope, the Tiptoe Intermediate. Oh, this is great. So they have different courses you can play. On the uh, Magnavox Odyssey 2, I remember they had different courses that we could play. And that looks like it for the manual. I love manuals. They have all the info we need. All right, let's take a look at skiing. This was released sometime in January. We said January 10th, 1981 for our color computer. So here we go. You have options to start the game, make a new course, or switch joysticks from simple to complex. We're just going to boot it up and start. This is uh, Robert G or Jay Kilgus. Way to go, Robert. So here we go. Starting the game. This is it. We're here. Three-dimensional skiing. No way. I hope that sound came through. Did you hear that? The home computer just talked to me. Wow. I'm playing first-person skiing. This is the first time on a home computer. I can't believe this because we've already played skiing for Atari and the Intellivision. And it's the same that we'd, we'd be used to seeing. But this, this is three-dimensional skiing. This is like, this is incredible. And the only sound effects I'm getting are me hitting the flag if I mess up. But the talking, the game actually said, get ready and get set. So cool. I really hope we see more games that are doing that. Because the arcade was when we first heard video games talk to us. Or speech synthesis. And, oh, this is awesome. And it actually has the three dimension of going up and down the slopes. Using similar graphics to what we saw with like Night Driver in the arcade. Oh, <laughs> and there's a little dot at the bottom of the screen that's showing me, well, I guess, where my player is. But I love how clean this is. There's no user interface. It just feels like I'm I'm on the slope skiing. Let me see if I can change the... What's the graphics change? Is it C? Because it, feel, it feels like I'm uh, skiing at night right now. But there, there's uh, different ways you could switch out the graphics. So cool. Let's see if I can hear the crowd. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Okay, so this is skiing for the TRS-80 color computer. Wow, that is ahead of its time skiing right there. And you can see there's other options. You have different courses you can choose from, and then you have different joystick controls, but that worked excellent. First time, right out of the gate. We're playing on the analog controller. So for that, oh man, I don't know how to do that one because usually sports games... We're rating them around average, but for three-dimensional skiing, that was amazing. Uh, I'm going to go... I'm trying to think of... We, we rate this based on the time. We also rate it, rate it based on everything else we've seen. So from everything else we've seen, uh, we've seen first-person when it came to flight games. Cosmic battles in space. We've seen first-person like um, a battle zone inside of a tank. And we've seen first person with driving games like in the arcade. But uh, for home computer, the only time I can think we've seen first person was like on the Atari for uh, Star Raiders. Like um, uh, flying your ship. And it, But this one had like the, the slopes and it felt like you were there uh, playing it. So I almost want to go five. But that's uh, considering the number of game modes, um, it has some options. But this is way up there. So I'm going to go four and a half stars for skiing. Surprisingly, our first video game from 1981. And it's way up there. Plays well and uh, is just a blast. All right, so after skiing, our next game is The Demon's Forge on the Apple II. Let's take a look at the artwork for The Demon's Forge. That is some crazy artwork. Now, who are we? Are we the... Oh, wait. We got to be the guy on the Falcon. We must be the, the, the badass knight. And that guy that's on the snake is the guy that's captured the princess, and we got to come get the princess, but excellent artwork for the front of there. And this is a, another uh, box front. Looks like this one's an alternate version. It almost looks like it's taken from a movie, like someone took a still from a movie and put it on the front of the box. Uh, not as bright as the other one, but uh, Demon's Forge. 
It's a dungeon network, has an exit and an entrance, but no one in the past centuries have escaped alive. And there's the back of that box that we just saw. So it looks like this is a graphic adventure game, a text or interaction fiction with some graphics at the top. And we've already seen a few of those on the channel. Yeah, there you go. There's the back of the other box. So it looks like we got two different variations of the box, probably released at different times. You can see over here, uh, copyright 1981 is the other one. Not seeing a date on that one, but uh, two different variations of the box. So that's cool. Death to him, your majesty. He killed four of your guards in a tavern brawl. Oh, nice. They give you like a little story before you play. And it looks like we're playing as a gladiator in this one. Now, I am aware of Demon's Forge because of uh, uh, Lazy Game Reviews. He did one on Demon's Forge. And uh, I've been told this is notoriously difficult, very hard to play, very cryptic. The developer made all the puzzles. <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't say it's that cryptic because we've already been playing the Sierra Online games. And those are the same way. If you don't have the manual and know what exactly to type in the text parser, it's extremely difficult. So uh, I would say it's pretty much par for the course, uh, for the time at least. And we don't have a manual, for, no manual for the Demon's Forge, but we're going to pop it in and see. Here we go. This is January 24th, 1981, and we're playing the Demon's Forge for our Apple II. And like usual on co personal computers, we're going to boot this sucker a little bit faster so we can get in the action quick. Sometimes it takes a while to load. There we go. Oh, wow. There's no title. It just went right into the game. We're just here, and you're at the entrance of the cave. Enter the command. Uh, go door. Maybe if you choose a direction. Ah, north. Does north work? Or typing in work? It does, yes. Anytime we can get a command correct on a graphic adventure game, it's awesome. You're in the entryway. There is a costume here. We'll get that costume. Got it. Do we need to wear it? Wear costume? Oh, I put the wrong thing. Wear costume. Okay, you're wearing them. Yes! Okay, so this game is actually responding to us. All right, let's try going east. Do we go in that door right there? We do! We're in there. You're in the long east-west hallway. Okay, so keep going east. Or do we go north now? Oh, no, we're here. It's working. I don't believe this. This 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 game is actually making us move around inside of a, a graphic adventure game. This is the old armory. A skinny man goes running by. I didn't see a skinny man. Did I miss him? Enter a command. Look. What do I get by looking? This is the old armory. Okay, the, it's the, the exact same thing. Very interesting how the text is almost the same as what we've seen for the Sierra Online games. I don't think it's using the same engine. It couldn't be, but uh, it's funny because it looks exactly the same. Screen at the top, same out, same uh, layout, and then the, the text at the bottom, just like the Sierra Online games. All right, let's try going north. And at this point, we'd be drawing our maps to go around because it looks like we got a maze. This is the junction route. Okay, let's keep going north. If you're just now joining us, this is the Demon's Forge for the Apple II. Oh, there's a statue of a bird head in here. Okay, it's just a statue. That's good. Get bird. Sorry, you can't get that. There's something else over there. What is that? Look table. There's nothing unusual about it. Look bird. There's something inside the beak. So I'm familiar with these adventure games on the channel because they're still using text or sorry, two word parsers. So it's usually a noun verb. And uh, it, so it's a little rudimentary. The only thing we've seen more advanced is Zork. And so you have to think in the mindset of a, uh, you're just gonna do noun verb to play the game. Look inside the beak, something in the beak. Get beak. Uh, what about open beak? Oh, it's already open. Uh, look beak. There is definitely something inside. Okay, well, uh, see, now you have to think in two words. How would I describe? How am I going to get inside that beak? Reach beak. Snap shut on your hand for eternity. Oh my gosh. Does that mean the game's over? <laughs> I put my hand in. And I'm trying to get something from there and it snaps shut and I'm dead. 
That's it. It seems that you are dead. Do you want to play again? Yes. <laughs> that would be the brutal difficulty that I've heard about. Probably instant deaths. Oh, yeah. And I'm already back at the beginning. Yep. Enter, enter the cave. Go north. So it is par the course what we've seen for graphic adventure games. But at least we got somewhere. We were able to get a costume, wear a costume, move around the room. But that's how it was uh, for most uh, graphic adventure games for the time. Well, I had a blast. Despite the crypticness, uh, if I was in 1981 and sat down to play the game, I don't think I'd get as far. Or about the same as the Sierra Online games. Mystery House and Wizard and the Princess, to name a couple. So with, with that, uh, for star rating, I'm going to give it around the, the use Because... I know the graphic adventure should be something better because of the graphics, but we've already seen uh, some better adventure games, and it's true we haven't gotten very far. So for the time, I would consider this around average uh, for, for what you'd play. Um, as far as the text parser, I don't think it would be considered better or worse than anything else we've seen, but I'll go ahead and go three stars for the Demon's Forge. It's, it's part of the course, but it probably caused still a lot of frustration for how many times you died in the game. And there's only one player. You'd be playing with some people behind you yelling out stuff. Try this, type this, do that. All right, so after the Demon's Forge, a perfectly average game for 1981. Let's go on to our next release. All right, it's another Game & Watch. So this is Nintendo's handheld at the time in 1981. Let's take a look at the artwork for Manhole. This will be released in Japan. I'm not familiar with all the Game & Watch games, so this will be my first time checking these out. There's the back of the box, and a reconstructed back of the box, how to insert the batteries. There we go, we have this the screenshot. Just like all the Game & Watch games, it's played on an LCD screen with the characters all programmed in, just like this. When you first boot it on, they all show up, and then when you play, they come out, they, they appear at the right time to make it look like it's moving. And I believe that is it for screenshots. So, uh, no manual, and we don't need them for the Game & Watch. Here you go. This is January 29th, 1981, and we're playing Manhole, the gold version. The first of Nintendo's Game & Watch Gold series. Alright, so the way this works is, on the bottom of the screen, you have Game A and Game B. And uh, like all Game & Watches, you have the time, because it's a game and it's, it's an actual watch that you can program. And for this game, we have four buttons on either side. Let's see what happens when we start it up. We're going to push Game A, and looks like... Okay, I see. So I have control over four, the four different buttons. You can see me push the buttons, and it looks like I'm walking uh, creatures over. Let's try all four. Yeah, okay. I see. So you have to just know which button to push and continue to let the, the men walk over the top. Kind of like we just saw in Steel Worker last year, which I thought was the first game that was the, the Lemmings Light game. But it, uh, essentially, manhole is the same thing. We're, we're, it's very simple, of course, but handheld, you're doing... Uh, mindless people walking and moving and then you help them over the top just like lemmings at least lemmings is what I'm familiar with but now thanks to chronologically gaming I'm gonna have a total new outlook on what was really first or which game did it first and that's one of the reasons we have chronologically gaming so there you go you can see how it plays and it's gonna progressively get harder and harder more people are gonna start coming on the screen and you got to be ready and push those buttons as fast as you can. But it just keeps going on and on uh, to the next one. There we go. Nice. All right. And just for fun, let's push game B. Oh, I see. I missed one. <laughs> oh, and it has a, a tally of how many I miss. Let's see if we can get both of these guys over. Oh, I got a little grace period. That's nice. Right, so let's push game B and give B, uh, game B a shot. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> Once you're in game A, a it won't let me go to game B. You're stuck. Does it work? No. So you got to keep it going, and it looks like three misses, and then you're out. Does game B work now? There we go. Okay, let's see if there's any difference with game B. Is it faster? For the time, this is an excellent time waster. Great game to have on the go. We've already seen interchangeable cartridges for handhelds on the Milton Bradley Microvision, and so this wouldn't trump those kind of games, but it still is excellent for 1981. I don't see a difference in game B. It looks like exactly the same as game game A. So for option-wise, I uh, yeah, 
right off the bat can't tell, but obviously you continue to play this a lot. This would be if you were you know on a bus or, or waiting somewhere way before smartphones, and you just keep playing, try to get the higher score, and then eventually you'd probably throw it down and be like, ah, oh, this is stupid, I'm not going to play it ever again. But since there was nothing else, you'd come back and remember, oh yeah, I got 14 last time, I bet I can get more than that. And then you play again and try to get a higher score, and that's that's how I would consider Game & Watch in 1981. All right, so that was our first gold series of Game & Watch. That was Manhole. For the time, that is pretty average. Um, I'm going to give it a little a little nudge up for uh, the, the creativity of um, continuing to have someone move across the screen. But it's still a time waster, but still an excellent handheld to have. So three and a half stars, just slightly above average for presentation for Manhole. All right, so after Manhole, our next game is... Oh, it's the next magazine by Byte. So this means we're in February of 1981. And let's take a look at just the cover of Byte magazine because this is a journal that is hundreds of pages long. So from the front of the, uh, the front of Byte magazine, the February issue, oh, this is nice. If you look, it has the five and a quarter floppy disk, the cassette tape, and then the computer with someone's mouth. So it's, yeah, the computer and voice synthesis, which we just saw on the Coco talking on the computer and reading the computer. So let's see if Byte Magazine has anything cool in the table of contents of what's happening in 1981. The extremely low-cost computer voice response system. It's 1981, and they're talking about computer voice response, which that's otherworldly. I can't think of uh, the first time I ever heard about using your voice with a computer would be Dragon Software in like the late 90s. And so now we have, of course, Siri and Alexa and all these different smart computers. So it's amazing to think of. They're already talking about voice synthesis from 1981. And then the next section looks like it's a computer-controlled tank. Uh, spectral analysis. More Pascal. That must have been catching on. And then uh, dynamic memory for the page 142. If you're not familiar with the, the the term, it is something that we've we've already blown past. But to think of dynamic memory as the first well, one of the first things from 1980 uh, from, from from this era is pretty cool. All right, so heating and cooling management, and looks like Radio Shack, Daisy Wheel Winner, Infinite Basic. Oh, and we got a review for Zork, the Great Underground Empire. That's awesome. So we played that at the end or some at some point back in 1980. So there's a review by someone playing Zork. That's awesome. So that is Byte, and we're obviously not rating in the magazines. So we'll move and press forward to our next game. Here we go. This is New Rally X for the arcade. Last year we gave Rally X five stars. It was the best or one of the best arcade games you could have played. Let's take a look at the artwork for New Rally X. There's the advertisement flyer. This is developed by Namco. Oh, nice. We got a, a advertisement flyer from Japan there. So developed by Namco and distributed by different companies like Midway. And I think Namco did the di distribution in Japan. So what's different about New Rally X? Yeah, same controls. Move all around. You got one button for smoke screen. There's our arcade marquee. And the screenshot looks the same. I bet they're just changing up the maps is my guess. Looks like we got the main version and a bootleg version. Here we go. Let's... Step up to the arcades and see what new Rally X is like. It is February 1981, and this is by Namco in the arcade. It's booting up the same as Rally X as well. And we do have a few different artworks we can check out, but I'm going to keep it on this one. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, new Rally X. Same car. We're blue. Enemies red. Checkpoint, special checkpoint. Ooh, they got the L flag. Lucky checkpoint. I don't know if they had that one. Or maybe I wasn't paying attention. So this is our track mode. Rally X is still on top as far as an excellent arcade game. But it's kind of difficult to gauge a game that is so close to the original. Kind of like we did with um, Asteroids Deluxe. It was really close to the original Asteroids. Or Space Invaders Deluxe. They, it was just the company trying to cash in on the popularity of the first release. And this would be the same with new Rally X. So I can't blame Namco for doing that. But how would you say which one's better? Because this came out the next year. But it's still essentially the same game. There's not too much they're doing different. My guess is it's just the layout, the level layout. All right, so let's put a coin in and push start. You see the copyright 1981 for New Rally X. Oh, man, I love the way this plays. 
And we got the constant music in the background. Oh, there's our lucky. It just ended all our fuel. Oh, it gave us new ones. Okay, so it gave us all the points for the fuel we were we had, and then... Oh, please don't lock me in. So you have only so much fuel to collect all the flags. You use the radar on the right side. Looks like I only have one enemy. But the way this controls is incredible. Yeah, this is still going to be at least a four-star for um, the presentation. Music uh, in the background. Classic era arcade game. So cool. Oh, we can, we can drive through our own smoke screens? That's awesome. And then when you collect all the flags, you move on to the next level. Gives you the points for your fuel. The big draw on why we rated it so high last year is because we're traveling past the, the single screen. It is a scrolling game in multiple directions. And uh, Namco's trickery here is so cool. It is... Oh, there we go. Nice. It is essentially a vertical and horizontal only. Notice it's not doing anything diagonal. So whenever you play the game, it, it's it giving the illusion that you have more things you can go for or collect, and the screen's going to scroll in that direction, but it's it's only going vertical and horizontal. No diagonal scrolling or anything like that. That, that would be a, a very difficult to do at the time. But they play it off so well, and it still it looks really smooth. But come on, the music going in the background is so good. One thing I love about the play control is it's not really like you're controlling a car. We played games in the arcade that are trying to simulate, you know, the steering wheel and stuff like that. But uh, this one, you can quickly turn the car around the opposite way. You just push the joystick the other way and then boom, you just move the, the, the opposite direction. But now we're going to get crazy. How many cars do we have? Oh, this is the challenge stage. That's why. There we go. <laughs> New Rally X, so good. We're at the challenge stage. This is 1981. Great way to start the year with a brand new Rally X game. While we don't showcase it on the channel, obviously the, the other games we've seen from 1980 and a little earlier, they're still out there. People are still playing the original Asteroids because it's still in the arcades. But we all only check out the newest. What's brand new? All right, now we're getting into the difficult territory. I've been going uh, way too well, maybe because we had practice on the last one. And familiar with the game, but I think it's because they actually started being really easy. And now they're going to have yeah, crazy fast cars. You can see the radar. The, the, the enemies are coming after me so quick. Come on, there it is. Nice. Another thing companies will do is release a very similar game to what they have already released because they already have copycats out there that are sealing the market, so they want to get something else that is their own property out there. Alright, so there you go. That is New Rally X. That's still way up there. I mean, I still got to give this one uh, over four stars. It's so good and plays so well. Uh, considering we've already seen uh, one before, no, it's, it's still up there. I... I don't know if I want to go as high as a five star though, because I don't know what the rest of the year holds, but from everything else we've seen so far, I'll go five. It's still a five star game. Five stars for New Rally X. It's just so good. All right, so after New Rally X, what is our next game? All right, so this is Scramble in the arcade. Let's take a look at the artwork for Scramble. Highly influential. Highly amazing. Uh, take a look at the advertising flyer for Scramble. We got some actual actors dressed up as 1950s aliens, I guess. <laughs> There's you on the left side. You're in the plane. And they have um, bases that are coming to shoot you and, ex and, and, and destroy you. And you can see on the, the, the right side, it's, I guess, some, uh, some, some pasty white aliens are trying to blow you up. Enemy alert. Repeat. Enemy alert. Astro pilots, man your aircraft, and good luck. Make a mad dash for Scramble, Scramble, Scramble. There's the arcade cabinet, upright cabinet for Scramble. 
Very nice. Our PCB, there's our control panel. Looks like we have moving up and down, moving fast and slow, and then we have a bomb and lasers. So two buttons that we can use while we play the game, and there's our arcade marquee. That looks cool. That's the Stern arcade marquee, and I think this is uh, distributed by different people. Yeah, and there's just some examples of screenshots. All right, let's take a look at the manual for Scramble. Oh, this is great. So Scramble's a big one because I think it's the only horizontal scrolling shooter we've seen on the channel. We've seen a vertical scrolling shooter and some some variations of it because of the Starfield that was popular by Galaxian. But I think this is the only one we've seen ho horizontally scrolling. Object of the game is to invade five Scramble defense systems and destroy the base. Use the joystick to move up and down and accelerate and decelerate. Use lasers and bombs to destroy rockets, fuel tanks, mystery targets, and UFOs. Hit fuel tanks for extra fuel for aircraft. And of course, like usual, we get bonus aircraft. So that's it. That's a great introduction. We don't need to install it. Let's take a look at it. other... Oh yeah, since it's so popular, we got a bootleg on Galaxian hardware. Different bootlegs. A French bootleg. And then, uh, yeah, Stern did release it. So two examples of Stern. Let's play the original. This is developed by Konami and the original in Japan published by Konami. This is February 1981. And right off the bat, look at that artwork. It is awesome. I'm just checking out the attract mode. There, that's the draw. Playing a game from the side view or a shooter from the side view. Let's see if we have other video options we can do. All right, so we got uh, this one that we're looking at is the Stern one. And then we have Zakaria, which is the Italian. Holy moly. That is amazing. Look at the control panel down at the bottom. Uh, the bombs, the fire. So this is what you'd see where the joystick is. And then instructions on the far left. There you go. Manufactured under Konami license. Wow, that is incredible. So there's the example of Zakaria's. And then we also got the cocktail versions. There's the cocktail table for Stern's and Konami's. Nice. Very hard to see the instructions probably from your end, but uh, excellent for a cocktail cabinet. And then inner bezel only. Oh, that's just the um, inside of it. So really small play field though. All right, so we'll check out and play on uh, Zac... Oh man, that's hard to tell. Uh, yeah, we'll go with Stearns. Love it. All right, let's put a coin in. First time playing Scramble. Oh, nice. Okay, so we got two different modes to fire. We have a bomb, and we can shoot straight ahead. And you can see here, the controls are up, up, up and down. And then you also have a fuel meter at the bottom, which is essentially time. But every time you bomb a fuel source, then you get uh, more fuel. I'm actually going to readjust my fingers to pretend like I'm playing in the arcades. But this is the first time, if my memory is correct of us playing a shooter uh, going horizontally. <coughs> and notice that it gives the illusion that we're flying um, uh, horizontally, but the background really isn't scrolling, it's static. So remember that whenever we see Moon Patrol eventually, because I know that one's coming up as well. Every other shooter we've seen has only been from the, uh, oh, did we lose fuel? Oh, we did, yeah, fuel ran out, so I gotta remember to keep bombing fuel fuel sources. There's one, oh, missed it. <laughs> Eventually when we do see Moon Patrol, it's gonna be the first, at least to my knowledge, the first um, parallax scrolling game. And this one made it look like it sort of was doing it, but it, it was not. The background was static. And this is pretty cool. Every other game we've seen has been a single screen. 
or pretending to scroll using that Starfield from Galaxian. Oh, nice. Now we're in the third mode. They're changing up the way the game's played, and now we're just dodging uh, asteroids. Oh, I gotta remember about my fuel. Not looking good. There's one. And you also can... Speed up and slow down your targets. Oh, very tricky, but so much fun. There we go. Get... <laughs> right when I ran out of fuel. So, first run, very good for Scramble. But you can see how the game was changing. Uh, if you look at the top of the screen, it had different levels. And we saw a few other games from the uh, late 70s that did that, where they switched up the game, uh, either by bringing new enemies in or a different play style. But this one's on a, a different level. Uh, it's, it's changing the way the game's played. You know, you saw asteroids coming at us from the side, and then we had buildings, stru uh, structures. So it wasn't the same, same thing. All right, let's put another quarter in, and let's go again. This time, let's switch up the artwork and go with Zakaria's artwork. All right, so here we go. This is Scramble. And it looks like, yeah, they started this right from the beginning again. <laughs> I gotta remember to switch my... That's it. There, yeah, okay. Once I get my fingers ready for an arcade game, it's very different. The other thing that this does that we haven't seen with the other games is I can shoot multiple bullets, and at the same time, I can also shoot multiple bombs. So I can shoot two bombs and two bullets. Look at how much firepower I have. Going to be a big influence for um, another game we're going to see at some point, which is uh, Xevious. Dropping bombs or ch changing the fire mode to where uh, you're not just sh shooting forward. There we go. That's the way. Oh, I flew too low. Can't believe it. Oh yeah, that's this is great. The game begins where you feel like you have a lot of empowerment. Like you can uh, do so much with your shots. But then um, it progressively adds difficulty and kind of puts you in your place. But that feeling in the beginning, considering every other game we've played, this is, is excellent. Get them both. Oh, so close. All right, looking pretty good. <laughs> oh, it hit the top of the mountain. Game over, player one. All right, one more shot at Scramble. Let's switch up the artwork again. Uh, we won't go for the cocktail version. Here we go. We'll go for the Konami cocktail. All right, put another quarter in and push and start. There we go. Not just for the firepower, but the game itself uh, plays really well and feels good. The scrolling is very smooth, but graphically it's not doing anything too crazy, except for um, us, you know, scrolling to the right side. And I really do enjoy having to balance out your your bombs or tying your oh, <laughs> time your hitting bombs at the same time while you're attacking enemies that are coming on top. Missed it. Uh oh. All right, we're on to the next phase, but I don't think I can get fuel. Oh yes, got it. All right. All 
Oh, see? So tight. With the timing of the bombs. Wow. And there we go. We're on the fourth phase now. No. We can go one more, I think. Yeah, there we go. And fourth phase is really hitting on your uh, bombs to save you since you cannot shoot any of these ships. No! There you go. So it looks like that would be uh, all that will play for Scramble, but that is insane. That is a really good game. Highly influential, uh, very playable, and uh, very first horizontal shooter that we played on the channel. So... Uh, that's tricky for a rating. I'm, it's, 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 it's so high up there, but I don't know if I want to go for five or not. Um, because I kind of peaked and the next game is Defender. And I know Defender is going to be five considering every other game we played, but Scramble's still very, very good. Um, do I want to go as high as five? Is it that good? Yeah, we'll go five. Five for Scramble. It is one of the best games, if not the best, that you could have played up to this point. All right, so after Scramble, our next game, oh man, is the iconic Defender. So good. Oh, wow. All right, so for Defender, let's take a look at the artwork. Oh, yes, there it is. By Taito. Comes with us from the same company that did Space Invaders that started the whole shooter craze. And uh, let's look at back of the advertisement flyer. At last, freedom to do the things you always wanted to do in a video game. Freedom to soar and glide through space. Freedom to move forward, backward, up and down. Freedom to move swiftly or slowly as you wish. Freedom to transcend space and time and to command undreamed of power. At last, you are free to be a true defender. Object of the game is to prevent the enemy from kidnapping the stranded humanoids on the planet's surface. It's best to shoot the enemy before they make the kidnap. However, if you're too late, you can shoot the enemy after kidnap and catch the humanoid before they fall to their death. If you fall, if you fail, the kidnapped humanoid mutates and you have other deadly enemies to face. You can shoot the enemy with lasers or smart bombs. However, smart bombs should only be used in an emergency situation since their supply is limited. You also have many defense options. The hyperspace button instantly catapults you into a different random point in space. The reverse button enables you to change direction instantly. The thrust button is able to control your speed. The scanner, which is radar, is at the top of the screen and gives you a mini view of all the positions of the enemy. Skillful for the use of the scanner will enable you to be at the right place at the right time, either to avoid or attack the enemy. And for Smart Bomb, it's activated by a special button. When used, it will destroy all enemies on the screen at one time. Defender, free at last. There is our arcade cabinet for Defender. And you can see this one was distributed by Williams. Excellent and classic. This is one of the best, if not the best, game in the golden age of arcades. Highly regarded as, as the best one. There's our control panel. We have movement for up and down, uh, reverse, thrust, smart bomb, just like we saw on the advertising flyer. Yeah, look at all our controls. So it is just moving up and down because it is a horizontal shooting, uh, sc scrolling game. We have fire, hyperspace, thrust, reverse, and smart bomb. And then there's our uh, arcade marquee, the Taito version of it. And that's just some awesome artwork there for Defender. Fan art for Defender. Um, all right, let's see what we got for the manual for Defender. So this is the Williams manual, and this one says October of 81, and that would be when it was released in North America by Williams. We're going to be playing the original by Taito, and uh, speaking of which, this release was really close. I mean, we have two horizontal scrolling shooters, Scramble and Defender, and I kept trying to see if I could find if there was a difference, because I thought for sure that Scramble came first, and then Defender was a little bit later. But um, in my research, Scramble and Defender were, were basically neck and neck on the release. This is... Um, uh, this was originally by Konami. So Konami did this one and then uh, developed it. And then uh, Taito developed this one. And in Japan, apparently they were, were out pretty much at the same time. 
but it was so hard to find the difference. And honestly, because of that, I know I'm going to go five stars for Defenders, so I'm going to have to bring Scramble down just because it is that good and that influential. But see, now I'm second guessing it because I can't, I can't pick that say one's better than the other. I'm just going to say that both are the, the, one of the best games you could have played in 1981. Between Scramble and Defender, they're, they're both five star for sure. All right, so back to Defender. Let's get in the manual for Defender. This is the Williams manual. Going through operation, and we got contents. I want to see introduction. Pass the PCBs. Uh, oh, introduction is not about the game. It's just about introduction of the diagram and the electronics. It's a very technical manual. Does it have anything about? It does not. Yeah, it looks like we got nothing. The only thing we got for instruction was from the advertisement flyer. It told us about how it works. You're saving people before they fall to their death or to get transformed into aliens. All right, for alternate versions. Oh my gosh, for something so popular, it came out in both different labels. The blue label, the green label, the red label, and the white label. We have a bootleg version, and then we have another game called Defense Command, which was a Defender bootleg. All right, so we actually are nearing the end of our evening, so we won't be able to check out Defender tonight. We'll keep you on the edge of your seats, and we'll kick off more of 1981 with Defender the next time we meet. In the meantime, have an excellent evening. We will see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we miss any games along the way. This video would not be possible without RetroArch and LaunchBox. Please tell your friends there's some crazy guy out there trying to play every single video game. You can always check out Chronologically Gaming on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We will catch you next time.